Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the fourth Hot Electronic Seminar talk of the Fall 2018 edition. My name is Chris Kapulkin. I'll be your host today. Uh, before we start, just a couple of uh, reminders and announcements. So we will have a one hour talk followed by a 30 minute discussion. Uh, we encourage you uh, to ask questions and uh, make interruptions during the talk. Uh, the strength of a seminar like that lies not only in the fact that we have the world's best experts giving talks, but also that we get the questions, comments, and insights from the world's best experts. So any interruption that you may have is highly appreciated. Um, with the speaker's permission, we will post this video, uh, with the, the video from, from this talk online, and so your comments will be remembered forever by generations. Um, okay, if you, if, you wanna, uh, if you wanna ask a question, obviously uh, just, just go for it. So unmute your microphone, interrupt the speaker, don't be shy. Uh, definitely, definitely don't be shy. And uh, finally, uh, that's something new, but if that's okay, uh, we would like to ask you to please keep your video on. It's a bit awkward for the speaker to talk to a bunch of uh, black screens. Instead, if you could like, keep your video on to give this feeling of a, of a regular seminar, uh, that, would be, that would be highly appreciated. Obviously, if you're you know, watching it in your bed and just wearing your tighty whities then we also appreciate you're not turning your video on, but in all other circumstances, essentially, uh, that would be great if you can keep it uh, on. Um, okay, so uh, I, uh, I hope you'll turn your videos on uh, soon. Uh, and uh, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Nikolai Kraus of the University of Nottingham, who will speak about some connections between open problems. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris, for uh, hosting this meeting. And thanks for inviting me, of course. And, and thanks for introducing me. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I cannot see if if anyone has a question, then just interrupt me uh, by, by talking, because I cannot see the chat uh, while I have the, the slides on full screen. Right, okay, so I would like to talk about some connections between some problems in, in HOT. And um, so, so there are a couple of open problems which I would like to see solved in HOT and a couple of theories which I would like to see developed. And I want to use the first half of my talk to, to explain why, why I think these are all connected and in which order we should attempt to solve those. And uh, the second half of my talk, I will use to talk about one of these things in some more details. Uh, hopefully I will have time. Okay, so uh, I use the screen as some sort of blackboard, which has two halves and uh, the left side I will use to, to develop a diagram. So I will not erase this part and the right side of the, of the slide, I will use to explain whatever I'm currently explaining. So, so the first of these, open problems in homotopy type theory is defining semi-simple types. So I'm sure that uh, most of you who are listening are very familiar with this problem, but uh, let's, let's go over it very quickly. So by our semi-simple type, we usually mean like a sequence of types and type families, like uh, it, it says in the, in the, in the top of, of the right side of, of the slide. So like we, we think of it as consisting of a type A0, which we think of points, and a, and a type family A1. So A1 takes two points as arguments, and we think of it as giving us a type of lines between these two points. And then A2 would take um, three points and three lines as arguments, and uh, they, they uh, form like a, an empty triangle, and we would think of A2 as, as being the type of fillers for this triangle. Okay, and it's, it's kind of straightforward to continue writing down this stuff. So if we are patient enough, then we can write down as many as we want of these um, type families. So next we would of course write down A3, which, which is a type family indexed over boundaries of tetrahedra and so on. Okay, let's make some space here. 
Um, so the, the, the open problem in, in homotopy type theory is not to write down <coughs> these type families manually, but it is to find some function from the natural numbers to any type universe such that at position n, like f of n, encodes the type of, 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 these, uh, of these tuples of type families somehow. And yeah, so, so I think this problem was first discussed in 2012 at the uh, HOT uh, Univalent Foundations um, special year program in Princeton. And it's still, still unsolved in, in normal homotopy type theory, but not for the lack of trying. So many people have tried to, to solve this and many people have tried different attempts, but it's still open. And um, so uh, at that time, Vladimir has proposed this uh, homotopy type system, which basically, uh, I mean, it's, it's not a solution to the original problem, it's kind of a cheat. So you, you just um, create some system where you can reason about uh, what would usually be judgmental equalities. And uh, you also have access to some sort of meta-theoretic natural numbers. And if you have this, then you can define some, some type of semi-simpletal types. But this is actually not what I want to talk about. So I'm just saying that there are type theories where we can solve this problem. And this is important because this means that we can do stuff which depend on this problem um, in, in at least some theories. Okay, so next. Um, well, it's, it's very natural to attempt to define some well, notion of infinity category inside HOT. And it's natural that we would like to develop some theory of infinity categories in HOT. Um, so this is natural because these higher categories occur everywhere. Um, and and um, well, for example, the universe should be some sort of infinity category, but internally in, in type theory, we cannot even say this. So we cannot even make the statement. And this is kind of unsatisfactory. And also we say things like the circle is the, the homotopy initial object in the category of circle algebras or something like this. You can substitute circle by any other uh, inductive type. And uh, so this is a bit weird because we, we cannot even talk about this infinity category because this is some statement about an infinity category. So the only reason why we can make such a statement is that we can define what it means to be initial in such a higher category without actually specifying the whole higher category. We only need to specify objects and morphisms and maybe uh, two morphisms as equalities and then we are ready to say that something is homotopy initial. Okay. But yeah, so it would be nice to have some full theory of infinity categories to make more general statements explicit inside type theory. Um, so since I want to connect these, uh, these problems, which I list on the left hand side, uh, maybe it's, well, it's kind of a trivial observation, but of course, if you have some theory of infinity categories and you have established that the universe is such an infinity category, and you also have a notion of infinity functors, then it's, it's very easy to define what you mean by semi-simplicial types, because then you can just take functors from this usual delta plus category to the universe. But uh, I mean, of course, this is a trivial direction because um, if, if you have such a theory of, of infinity categories, then you can defi define all sorts of functors and not just semi-simplicial types. Um, but, but so the, the more interesting question is, if we are in a theory where we have semi-simplicial types, how can we define some theory of infinity categories? And um, so my, my uh, favorite approach to infinity categories is by just mimicking uh, Siegel spaces. So basically we just replace space by type and, and uh, then 
everything kind of works out of the box. The only problem is that we have only semi simplicial types, so we are lacking degeneracies. But uh, yeah, so there's a very neat trick, actually a very simple trick, but also a very powerful trick, which is due to Harper's and uh, maybe also due to Lurie, but Harper's makes, made it precise. Uh, of course, not in the setting of type theory, but it can be translated one to one. So basically what you can do for completeness, well, that, that is shown at the very bottom of the slide now. So for completeness, you just ask for a semi-simplicial type, which, okay, sorry, I should say it the other way around. So first, uh, you start with a semi-simplicial type, and then you equip it with the usual Siegel condition in any uh, in any variation you you like. So I like to think of it as horn filling. So you say that whenever you find some inner horn, then the type of fillers for this inner horn should be contractible. Uh, so in the first picture, for example, you see that uh, if we have some inner horn which just consists of two morphisms, then we fill it and we get the composition. And yeah, if we if we have if we start with some uh, tetrahedron where one one phase is missing and we fill it, then what we get essentially corresponds to associativity of of the composition in this um, semi simplicial type. And yeah, so now because of this uh, semi thing, we don't have identities, but you can just ask that you can just add this uh, completeness condition which says that for any object there is some morphism with this object as, as domain such that this morphism has some special status. It behaves like an equivalence and it has the property that if you create some horn where this morphism is at the right position then you can fill outer horns. And in the, in the very bottom, on the bottom picture of this slide, uh, you can see that if you take some morphism E, which has X as domain, then uh, you just fill a horn and you get an identity on, on X. And the nice thing is that this will automatically fulfill all higher identity uh, laws or all higher coherences that you would expect. So basically everything works out of the box. This is a direct translation of, of uh, work by Rask and, and Lori and Harpards and so on into type theory. So there's really nothing that one, I mean, there, there are no bad surprises at all. Sorry, uh, but before you go on, can I ask uh, you to say a bit more about the trivial, the trivial direction here? So I, I, it's not clear to me um, where the category of, you know, sort of delta with the injections comes from and also why you would want to map into a universe for infinity categories as opposed to just a universe for types? I mean, basically, I just don't understand that, that direction at all, uh, how, how you get semi-simplicial types from a theory of infinity categories. Okay, sorry. Um, so, so I think this depends on what exactly we mean by semi-simplicial types. I haven't really specified this completely, but basically I just mean, I mean, ba basically this, this statement is uh, kind of tautological because by semi-simplicial type, what I really mean is a functor from this delta category into the infinity category of types. So by, by you, I mean the infinity category of types. I mean the universe seen as some infinity category. And the delta category is something that we can define as in the usual way. So objects are just natural numbers and morphisms are these uh, functions between finite types which are strictly increasing. So, so the delta category, we can always define very easily. We don't really need anything for that. And that's a set in, that, in the sense of homotopy type theory. So nothing can go wrong there. Um, and on, on the previous slide, when I discussed semi simplicial types, well, this maybe looks not exactly like a functor because usually when, when we try to define semi simplicial types, in, in homotopy type theory, we try to use it 
um, using this uh, redefi and encoding of, of such functors because like this is this is the, the I mean this is one possible approach which feels very natural in type in type theory where you always talk about type families and yeah so because here all the usual functor laws which I mean so we, we want to avoid talk, talking about functor laws, right? Because as soon as we talk about functor laws, we need to add coherences and this is very tricky. So what we do instead is encoding these functors in this redefined way where we talk about types and type families. And then the functor, the, the morphism part of this functor is just given by projections. And these projections are automatically uh, they automatically fulfill the usual functor laws. So basically the functor laws hold strictly. So we don't need to say anything about this. And since we don't need to say anything about functor laws, we, we get all coherences directly. Um, I'm not sure, does this answer your question, Emily? Uh, that's helpful, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I got told that I could maybe put the volume up, but I'm not sure how I can do this. I think this is maybe not possible because it's already at maximum. Sorry. Maybe just speak a little bit louder. Okay. Yes, I can uh, try to do that. Is it better now? Yes, that's much better. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> yeah. Um, Right, so I mean, of course, I'm aware that uh, like Emily and, and Mike have, have suggested a type theory where the basic objects are infinity categories. But what we are doing here is we are using the normal uh, homotopy type theory where the basic objects are infinity groupoids. And inside that theory, we are trying to develop some theory of infinity categories, uh, just as a clarification. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so, well, as I said, this, uh, this approach, which Paul and I have called uh, complete semi-segal types, uh, works out of the box. So, um, of course, well, well you, you take the semi-simple type, which has two, prop, uh, two conditions, namely this, the Siegel condition and this completeness conditions. Both of them are propositions, and since they are propositions, well, nothing but there's really not much that can go wrong. So they are extremely well behaved and don't need any further um, coherences. And of course, when you make such a definition, you, you need some justification why this definition is correct in some sense. So it's, it's quite easy to check that the special case where A1 is a family of sets and, and most of the same as type is trivial, so you don't really need it. So this special case, you can check quite easily that it's equivalent to the normal definition of univalent categories that you have in HOT. Like the, the, um, the definition of univalent categories that was given by Benedict, uh, Chris, and Mike. And uh, we also have checked that uh, the, the, the next more difficult special case where A2 is a family of sets, would give you some sort of uh, univalent two comma one categories in the way you expect. So everything works. And well, of course now to justify further that this is a reasonable notion, we should be able to demonstrate that we can develop some uh, reasonable theory with them. Um, we have done this partially, but most of it is work in progress. Okay, um, so, so if there are no questions anymore about this case, maybe let's go to the next open problem which I want to talk about. So this uh, problem is, well, I call it hot eating itself. Uh, so a couple of years ago, Mike has proposed that actually if we have type theory with n plus one universes, then we should somehow be able to use this to model type theory with n universes. So th this is maybe what one would expect. 
And the, the question is, or what we want to do here is really, we would like to implement hot inside hot. So that's maybe a quite natural thing that one would, might want to do again, because if we want to see hot as a foundation in which we can do anything we like, then at least we should also be able to implement hot in the system. So, yeah, um, there are actually many people who have worked on this. So, for example, uh, Ambrose Kaposhi has written his PhD thesis on this topic, and um, Torsten has given a talk on, on this topic in this seminar a couple of months ago. And then there are other people like uh, Martin and Chuanchi and I think Ulrich and Peter, Matthew and Dimitris have also worked on this. And I think my list is probably very incomplete. So please apologize if I didn't list you here. Um, and, and I think this, this problem of implementing type theory inside type theory is very appealing because when, when you hear about this problem, it, it feels like you immediately have some ideas how you would attempt it. So you would start by defining some type of contexts and maybe some type of context morphisms, like substitutions between these contexts and some family of types indexed over contexts and so on. But uh, so I think there are essentially two difficulties with this problem. So the first one is that type theory is very complicated and has many components. So if you want to equip this type theory with everything, including pi types and sigma types and so on, then you need uh, lots of definitions and lots of components which you want to put in. And you need to, I mean, organize everything very well in order to have a chance to make it work. Yeah, so even if you, but even if you overcome this problem, there's a second problem. And this problem I think is maybe in the beginning not, not as visible, but um, I think this is the problem why we have not fully solved uh, Mike's question yet. And this problem is again coherences. So usually if we talk about the syntax of type theory that we want to implement here, we would expect that the syntax forms a set in the sense of homotopy type theory. So we want to have some set of symbols or some set of types. And of course, types may not be sets, but since we are um, now using hot as the meta theory of this, of this theory, of course, in the meta theory, we have some set of, of, um, of possible types and some set of terms and so on. But um, yeah, so when we, when we actually define type theory and type theory, we need many equations. So we need, for example, we need equations for beta reductions and, and uh, all these things. And as soon as we add these equations, we also get in this coherence hell. So we need many, we need to add many coherences in order to make the whole thing well behaved. And so, well, we, we can avoid these coherences, but then we would, uh, if, we, if we started to set truncate everything so that all uh, higher equations that we would expect hold automatically. But if we do this, then the, the type theory which we are actually working on in is no longer a model for the type theory that we implement. So basically we cannot reflect, I mean, I mean we have no way of, of um, defining a function from this uh, type theory that we are defining internally to the type theory that we are working in, because this is what we actually want. Okay, um, so of course, a couple of months ago, Torsten has uh, given a talk on exactly this topic. So basically the, the idea is that we should not set truncate, but we should use, uh, we should use higher categories and, and define this type theory and type theory as some sort of infinity category with families in order to make sure that it's fully coherent and in order to, um, to organize all the equalities that we need. But yeah, so, so this maybe has some chance of working, but it's still not worked out. So it's still work in progress. Okay. so. Um, here's one further remark uh, already 
a couple of years ago, Mike has also remarked that if you were able to implement type theory and type theory such that the outer level, like the meta level of type theory is a model for the inner, inner type theory, then you would also be able to solve the problem of define, defining semi-simple types because it's very easy to generate these terms uh, which, which define semi-simple types um, in any programming language. So basically, if you take any programming language, you can write some program which, which takes a natural number and spits you out a string, which if you put it into ACTA or something, then uh, a proof assistant would accept that as some definition of, of uh, same simple types up to that level. So now if you could have uh, type theory implemented inside type theory, then you could write such a program in the inner type theory and interpret that in the, into the outer type theory where it would be a solution for the original problem. Right, okay, so I indicate this on the left hand side with this uh, arrow from hot eating itself to define semi simple types. Um, so, yeah, maybe you see in the diagram on the left hand side that some of my arrows are fat and some arrows are not fat. So, basically, my attempt would be to use the fat arrows to actually construct all these things and to solve these problems. And the thin arrows are what we get kind of for free. So I, I think people have also tried to first solve the problem of defining, uh, of, of implementing type theory inside type theory, and from there getting semi simple types. Um, I mean, I have no reason to think that this will not work. I mean, it, it could work, but to me, it seems that defining type theory and type theory is a harder problem than defining semi simple types just because it's much more complicated. Uh, so I would start with semi simple types, go to infinity categories from there, and go to the type theory and type theory problem uh, in the next step. Okay. Um, so, so now the next question that I want to talk about is what I call uh, minimal universal properties of truncations. So this uh, question is again, not very well defined and maybe it's uh, somewhat hard to motivate what I mean here and, and why I want to do this, but I hope it will become clear in my second half of this talk. <coughs> so the, the general question is, if we have types A and B, then how can we construct some function from the end truncation of A into B? So a priori, we know how to do this if B is n truncated itself. But if B is not n truncated, then this is, uh, this is difficult and we need to find a way to do this. And uh, so for example, if, if we, I mean, the, the, like the simplest uh, non-trivial instance of this problem, which sometimes occurs, is that we want to construct a function from the propositional truncation of a type A into a set, right? And for this case, you can show that in order to construct a function from this propositional truncation of A into a set B, what you need is a function F from A to B and a proof that this function F is uh, what I call weakly constant in the obvious sense, which means that any two elements of A will be mapped to equal elements in B. But now it turns out that if, if uh, B is not a set, but some more general type, then actually this is not enough. Um, Mike has uh, shown a proof of a related statement, like a, a Mike has shown a, a related negative statement on the, on the homotopy type theory block uh, also a while ago. Okay, so, yeah, what can we do in general if, if, we, if we are not in the special case? So we have a couple of constructions of truncations. So for example, by Flores and Echtbert. And uh, these constructions of the truncations, they do give us elimination properties 
from the truncation of a type into some arbitrary type. But um, yeah, the thing is that these uh, constructions are somewhat complicated. And now if you, you want to use them in order to construct functions out of truncations, you need to unfold the whole, uh, the whole constructions basically. And the elimination principles that you get are very difficult and maybe hard to apply. Uh, of course, it depends on in which, uh, so, so what exactly your goal is. But for the things which I want to discuss later, uh, I'm, I'm afraid it's true that they are somewhat hard to apply. Okay, so here's what I want to uh, do instead and what I call uh, minimal universal properties of truncations. So if we have this framework of infinity categories, then we can see any type as some infinity category. So basically we can take the underlying infinity groupoid. I write eta for this map here. Uh, so basically eta is just the redefined replacement of the constant of the diagram, which is constantly the given type. Good. And um, on the other hand, if we have some infinity category, uh, we can define this co-skeleton operation, which just removes higher cells uh, from a given level onwards. And uh, now in, in this framework, we can ask ourselves, well, mm, what are, well, so, so my conjecture is that if we take the underlying, uh, underlying infinity group point of A and we take the n plus one co-skeleton of this construction. And, and now we consider functions or in, in infinity functors into eta of b. Then this corresponds exactly to functions from the n truncation of a into b as functions in the, in the ordinary universe, uh, type theoretic universe that we started with. And um, so some years ago I have shown during my PhD that this works for the propositional truncation. So for the case that n equals minus one. And at that time I have not phrased it in terms of infinity categories because well, uh, we didn't have such a framework and actually we still don't really have it strictly speaking, but um, it, it was exactly that. And so um, some years ago I also and I think at the first uh, hot UF workshop in Warsaw, I also suggested that maybe we should use such a property to solve the problem of type theory and type theory. Because basically um, with such a property, we can, we can uh, use set truncations to, to remove all higher equalities from from some given types of, of contexts and morphisms and so on and type families in order to still get sets. So okay, the concrete suggestion was to yeah to to do the naive but very non-well behaved definition of of type theory and type theory, which is where the syntax is not a set, and then set truncate everything and use such um, elimination principles for truncations in order to still construct uh, the, the, the function into the ordinary type theory that we would want, where the type of contexts maybe could be, could be interpreted as the type universe and, and so on. Okay. Mm. Yeah, but uh, so this arrow kind of destroys my diagram, so I will uh, remove it again and make some space. Okay, so um, now I would like to come to what is going to be the second half of my talk. So there are several, uh, what maybe could be called elementary problems in HOT. So problems which, which uh, don't need any infinity categories or which which don't actually need any, um, yeah, which, need en which, which don't need anything. So there are some problems which are mentioned in the hot book, 
Uh, one of them is actually just mentioned in an exercise where it's also stated that it's an open problem and, and these problems still have no solutions. So one problem is, for example, if we have a set and we take the suspension of the set, which is just a, an ordinary, uh, very simple higher inductive type, then we can ask whether the suspension is a one type. And we know that this is the case if the set has decided the quality. So classically, the answer is yes. Um, but uh, without a classical principle in, in homotopy type theory, this is still unsolved. And maybe it's not so clear what this has to do with all the other open problems that I've talked about, because uh, the other open problems that I've discussed so far, uh, maybe they, they clearly consist somehow, as, somehow uh, of some infinite tower of structures, or there are infinitely many components of, of things. But now for, for these um, maybe elementary uh, open problems in, in type theory, well, they, they don't contain any such, or, or it's, not, it's not clear why they contain infinitely many components in any way. Um, so I, I haven't yet made this connection precise. I'm, I mean, I'm working on this and this is work on pro of, in progress, but in the rest of my talk, I want, to, uh, I, want to, I want to outline why I think there's some relationship and what I expect how this could work out in the end. So let's say, um, let's see. So I, I call these problems elementary, not because they're easy, but I call them elementary because they, they don't need much to formulate. So for example, there's this problem of the free group. So if we start with some type A, then we can take uh, what is usually called a wedge of A many circles. So this is just if we take uh, two, the two functions, like two functions from the type A to the unit type, and we take the homotopy co-equalizer of, of this type. Then we, we get what I here call WA, so uh, for batch of, of A many circles. Uh, we can write it as a higher inductive type with a base point where we add one loop for every point in A. And uh, now the free group can, can just be defined directly to be the loop space of, of, this, uh, of this wedge of circles. So yeah, we would want to know whether if A is a set, is this free group still a set? And uh, again, if, if A has decidable equality or if we assume ex excluded middle, then the answer is yes. But in general, the question is still open. So we can make it slightly more general and consider the suspension of, of the type A instead of the free group. But um, yeah, it's, it's nearly the same, just uh, we take a push out instead of a co-equalizer. And yeah, we ask a similar question. So now we just ask whether the suspension of A uh, written as sigma A is a one type if A is a set. Okay. Um, so then there's a similar problem which I think has a similar status at least, which I have asked a while ago on the hot mailing list and which I think is also still unsolved. But basically if we start with a one type B and we add a path to this one type. So let's say we have a one type B and we have two points in this, in this type B. So this is given by a map from, from two, the type of Booleans to B in this diagram. Now we take the push out along the map from two to the unit type. So now, we, and, and as push out, we get this type uh, B bar. And we can think of B bar as being B with one extra path added between the two points that we had chosen in the beginning. So intuitively, if B is a one type, then a single path shouldn't really change anything here. So the question is whether B bar is still a one type. But um, yeah, so well, I, I would actually, I mean, uh, my, my guess would be that this is actually really uh, something which is independent of HOT. So my guess would be that we, we, can, we cannot really show this in, in, the, in the style 
of type theory that is developed in the hot book. But of course, I could be wrong. Um, yeah, even, even when it looks so simple. Okay, um, so if we want to try to generalize all these questions that, like, like these three last questions, like the free group and the adding a path problem and so on, we can just formulate it as follows. So let's say we have some push out diagram of uh, types A, B, C, D, where A is a set and B and C are one types. And our question is under this condition, is, is D still a one type, right? So uh, classically, this is true. So in, in fact, we can show that if we have excluded middle, then this is true. Um, and um, yeah, so another remark is maybe that we cannot really generalize this further. At least I don't see how to generalize it further. We really need to insist that A should be a set because if A is not a set anymore, but maybe only a one type, then as the diagram on the bottom right shows, we cannot really say anything about the truncation level of the push out. And at the same time, well, we should really, we cannot really um, generalize B to be some higher type like there's this uh, square on the bottom left where B is a two type. And in this case, I think we can show that the push out is, is not a two type anymore. So this is some example which Paolo has showed me. Okay, mm, right. So, so what's the difficulty with, with any of these problems? So what's the difficulty with the last problem that uh, I have mentioned? So, yeah, again, we have this push out square where we know that A is a set, B and C are one types, and we want to characterize path spaces in, in D, or at least we want to know that the path spaces in D are sets. So that's what it means for D to be a one type. So now there is uh, the, the van Kampen theorem in homotopy type theory by Favonia and Mike, and that characterizes uh, the equalities in D as lists. So it's very intuitive. Basically some equality in so some path in D is something like a path in B, which uh, maybe then is connected via A to a path in C. And then maybe we can go back to a path in B and maybe go back to C and back to B and so on until we are tired. And um, yeah, so, so these lists, really correspond to equalities in D. But this is not, uh, I mean, this statement needs a small modification, otherwise it's not uh, true. So what we really, what, what uh, Mike and, and Favonia really do in this statement is they show that the set truncation of these path spaces in D is equivalent to the set quotient of certain such lists, which iterate between C and B. And uh, so this doesn't really help us very much with our problem because we want to show that these uh, path spaces in D are sets. And the, the theorem says that well, the set truncation of these path spaces is equivalent to some set quotient. So, well, yeah, of course. Um, but that doesn't help us to say anything about the not set truncated path spaces. Okay, so what we would need here is some uh, higher version of, of the seifert frank kampen theorem, right? Uh, so in general, the, the thing is that it's very difficult to form coherent quotients without uh, using explicit set truncations. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, so now one approach um, is the following. I think uh, one observation which is kind of uh, underused or maybe not used at all is that often when we quotient a type by an equivalence relation, then this equivalence relation is given in some uh, directed way. So for example, we say that a list can be reduced to another list if there is some radix somewhere in the list which can be removed. So we, we always reduce a longer list to a smaller list. Or 
in, in other cases of quotients, this also could appear. So for example, if you consider uh, a type of lambda terms implemented in type theory and we want to quotient these terms by, by, uh, by beta reduction, then at least if we consider simply typed lambda terms, there is some way how we can say that the, the beta reduced lambda term is smaller than the original lambda term. Yeah, this really needs, uh, <coughs> needs the lambda terms to be simply typed and so on. So, uh, okay, let's, let's try to make this precise. So let's say we start with some set W and the set W comes with a degree function, which maps any, any element of W to some natural number saying how, how large this element is. And now we have some family which I denote by a uh, squiggle. So the idea is that uh, squiggle um, tells us that one element of W can be reduced to some other element of W. So this is what, uh, I mean, uh, so, so before, maybe usually we, we just use a squiggle without this uh, little arrow which I here have uh, in the symbol to denote some equivalence relation. So here I want this to be read as some sort of directed relation. And um, yeah, so the, the directedness is encoded in the fact that if W reduces to V, then the degree of W will be larger than the degree of V. Here's a typo in the slide. Um, but uh, for, for this to make sense later and to be well behaved, I also want some sort of confidence property, which says that if W can be reduced to V and W can also be reduced to U, then there is some T such that both V and U can be reduced to T in, in arbitrarily many steps. So, uh, squiggle RT here is the reflexive transitive closure of, of, uh, of this relation, which, which we can define as some index inductive type if we want. It's, it's just the canonical thing. So uh, V squiggle RT, T just means that there's some sequence of, of elements of W such that uh, each element reduces to the next, and if you concatenate all of them, then in the end, V reduces to T. And also U reduces to T. Okay. Before you go on, uh, do we ask that the T um, in the confluence property uh, exists or just merely exists? It should exist. So it should be given by a sigma. <laughs> okay. So of course, the idea here is that in the end, we want to have something like W quotiented by this uh, relation. Okay, and, and hopefully, hopefully this uh, setup of this directed relation gives us uh, a way to do this without uh, losing as much as we usually lose when we form set quotients. Okay, um, yeah, in, in order to understand why this definition is useful, let's first consider the general case of general set quotients. So let's say we have any set X, X, and some equivalence relation it. And now let's write uh, X slash uh, squiggle for, for this future set quotient. And now I want to say something about this set quotient. Um, so, well, we cannot say very much about the set quotient, but we can say that um, equalities in the set quotient, they are uh, generated by this uh, relation, of course, that we put in. And uh, we can make this precise by saying that if we take the reflexive symmetric transitive closure of, of this uh, relation, then from any such, I mean, this is basically a sequence of, of elements which are related. And if we have such a sequence of elements which are related, then in the quotient, we will get an equality. So yeah, in, in, in general, um, this function, which I write as phi here, 
which constructs these equalities, this will in general not be an equivalence because you can imagine that there are many sequences of, of uh, related elements in X, which maybe get mapped to the same equality. And uh, yeah, so in, in, in the set quotient, these uh, different equalities will get identified, but the sequences are different. But you, what you can say is that this function phi is subjective. Okay, uh, so a consequence from the fact that this function phi is subjective is that if y is a one truncated type, then uh, functions from the set truncation into y, no, sorry, functions from the set quotient of x into <coughs> y correspond to, uh, uh, they correspond to triples. So first, we need a function from x to y, so that is to be expected. Then we need a we need a proof p, which says that whenever two elements in X are related, then in y they become equal. Yeah, that's also to be expected. And uh, third, um, whenever like third, we need to say that uh, if we take any sequence of related elements in in X and the sequence maybe starts and ends with A, then this sequence by P should be mapped to a commuting polygon. So it should be mapped to reflexivity in the end, right? So uh, this is to ensure that basically there is no ambiguity and, and you can really show that this type of triples is equivalent to functions from the set quotient of X into Y. So now let's maybe, um, yeah, so here I just say the same thing again. Uh, so maybe let's uh, observe what these components really are. So the function from X to Y is uh, clear. Um, so here I have this picture of a polygon. So this should, so the, the vertices should uh, just symbolize elements of X and the, the arrows between them are just, um, elements of, of these relations. So basically we have, here we have eight different elements of X and they are, and, and uh, many pairs are related by this uh, equivalence relation or by this relation, which might not even be an equivalence relation. And uh, this is done such that we, we get this, uh, this octagon in the end. Okay, so now F maps these, uh, points these vertices to elements in Y and P will map these arrows into equalities in Y and the property Q just says that in Y this polygon will commute or in other words in Y the, the, the equality that we get in the end will be reflexivity if we compose all these equalities that we get. Okay. Um, so now, unfortunately, this is maybe still very hard to use because we need to talk about this reflexive symmetric transitive relation of the relation that we start with. Um, so of course, if we start with an equivalence relation in the beginning, then uh, we wouldn't have to take the reflexive transitive uh, symmetric closure. But the idea is that in the beginning, we just start with some uh, generators of this relation. Okay. So in, in general, um, yeah, there will be many such polygons and uh, this condition is still very hard to check. So it's still very difficult to construct such a term Q. But now let's see what we gain from considering a directed relation. So let's again consider this such a polygon, but now let's uh, say that these elements are of W, of type W. And uh, the relation that we have is now has this directed property. And now I replace the vertices um, by the degree, I mean, instead of like before where I wrote just these uh, bullets for the vertices, I now just write the degrees of these uh, vertices. Right, so how the elements of W are called, I, I don't really care. 
but I, I care about their degrees. So now we have this uh, polygon here. And now what we can do is we can find some span. So for example, the span which has the seven in the middle and use this confluence property that we have asked for in order to, uh, in order to find a way to reduce the two endpoints of the span. So here we use the span uh, 276 and um, yeah, so the confluence property tells us that the two will reduce to something and the six will reduce to something. So both of them maybe not necessarily in one step, it could be in two steps. So here, for example, the six reduces first to something of degree five and then to something of degree one. And the two also reduces to the same thing of degree one. And now we can continue doing this. So let's look at some other span. So for example, the span with the six and uh, the, the legs to the five and the four. So now again, we can use this confluence property and uh, we again get something and we can continue doing this. And um, as long as this polygon is not trivial, we will always find some uh, local maximum or we actually will find, we, we even can find some, some element of maximal degree and we can uh, take such a span and use the confluence property to reduce it. And the end result of this thing is that if we continue doing this, then we will necessarily end up with a trivial polygon and we will have uh, disassembled the original polygon into small uh, confluence polygons. So basically any such polygon can be written as like, like can be constructed out of confluence shapes. Um, Right, and this is nice because now that we know this, we don't really have to ask for Q to map all polygons to commuting polygons in Y anymore. It is enough to ask that uh, P maps these uh, polygons or these mostly squares that we get from the confluence property to commuting, uh, to commuting polygons in Y. So the, the original property Q can be re, uh, replaced by this red property Q. Okay, so this is much simpler because there are many fewer confluence shapes than there are polygons. And also we, uh, in, in concrete examples, we can, I mean, we are actually choosing what our confluence shapes are. So we have a very strong control over what these confluence shapes are. Okay. Mm, so for these uh, quotients by directed relations, this gives us some way to construct functions from the set truncation into some one type. Um, so now let's go back to the seifert von kampen theorem uh, where we have A or set and C and B one types and we want to say something about D. So originally, uh, Favoni and Mike had the statement that that uh, if we set quotient lists, then this is equivalent to the set truncation of, of these equality types in D. And what we can now get using the thing at the top of the slide, we can get a map from the set uh, quotient of lists to the one truncation of these equality types in D. And um, so, like this is, I mean, this is really the hard bit of showing that these two things are still equivalent. So in the end, we want to show that the set quotient of these lists are really equivalent to the set truncation of these equality types in D. But uh, yeah, we are not there yet. Uh, so, um, so far we have only shown that there's a function into the one truncation. And uh, out of this function, we can create some equivalence proof and um, yeah, so then uh, this is the hard bit of showing that there's some equivalence. But okay, so we would want to generalize this even further, of course. And to generalize it further, uh, we need 
to know more. So now it's not enough anymore that confluence shapes are mapped to commuting polygons. So if you do the next step, uh, why is a two type, you would want to know that uh, yeah, Q maps these confluence shapes in some coherent way. So whenever we are given some, the boundary of some three-dimensional polyhedron where all the faces are confluence shapes, then uh, this, uh, the boundary of this three-dimensional thing should be mapped to some uh, trivial polyhedron in Y. But this seems very difficult because, well, again, we have many such um, three-dimensional polyhedra and uh, this looks very complicated and hard to handle. But here's one more idea. In, in many cases, we don't just have this confluence property, but we have some strong confluence property where, um, uh, so, so the strong confluence property would say that if W reduces to both V and, and U, then V and U can be reduced to the same T in at most one step each. So instead of taking the reflexive transitive closure of, of the relation, it's enough to take the reflexive closure. And if we do this, then instead of, uh, then for these confluence shapes, we don't just get any arbitrary uh, polygons, but now we will get some sort of uh, cubes or no, but at first we will get squares, maybe even squares where up to two sides can be trivial. But the important thing is these are squares and not general polygons. And uh, now squares seem to be much easier to handle. So if we go to higher dimensions, then these things will just become higher dimensional cubes. And yeah, these seem to be, this seems to be much more doable than arbitrary dimensional polyhedra. Okay, but um, yeah, I, I haven't yet uh, worked that out. So I mean, I don't know whether it will work in the end, but uh, I think I have reached the end of my time and the re end of my talk. So uh, thanks for your attention. All right, well, thank you very much. I'll now unmute everyone's microphone so that we can uh, thank the speaker. So here we go. Now I'll mute everyone. Uh, okay, everyone should be muted and uh, we'll take some questions. And by we, I mean Nicola. some questions, comments, um, everything, everything goes. Hi, Nikolai, uh, thanks for that. That was, that was really interesting. Um, can you say more about these confluent shapes? That What sort of shapes do you expect to get there when you finish that process of, of using the confluence property? Uh, so this basically depends on the concrete application. Right, so I mean, like, um, if we look again at the at this definition here, where I just define this this confluence uh, this confluence property um, as as the usual confluence property. So so now it really depends on which kind of quotients we want in the end. So maybe like in the in the Seifert von Kampen uh, example. We take W to be lists of of uh, of equalities which either come from B or from C and which are somehow connected by A. And in this case, we can make this definition such that um, if if a list reduces to another list in one step, and maybe the the same list reduces to a third list in one step, then we always can find a single list such that both of these smaller lists reduce to that new list in one step. So in that case, we would get a square. But of course, it can also be that um, it can also be that a list reduces to another list, but it reduces to that other list in two different ways. So um, in that case, we would get a trivial, like a, a square where two sides are 
um, non-trivial, but non-trivial, but possibly non-equal. But the other two sides are both uh, trivial. So, well, a reduction where nothing is happening. And I expect that in this example, if we go higher and, and uh, look at higher confluence shapes, then we will get uh, higher dimensional cubes. They're always, well, in, in the most complicated case, all the faces of the cube will be non-trivial, but we can have as many trivial cases as we want. So uh, yeah, it, it could be that half of the cube consists of uh, trivial um, reduction steps. So uh, if you map it to some type, then it would be automatically reflexivities, but um, yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. And so maybe a slightly related question. I, I didn't quite see in the second half how this related to the questions in the first half, because you, I think you drew an arrow and you said teaser on the arrow and about an implication. And I must have missed where you used some assumption there. Right. Sorry. I think I didn't make this connection very clear. So this is because in the second half, uh, most of the time I talked about this a uh, very special case where you where you don't generalize and you only do one single level and and this case really can be done in in ordinary homotopy type theory so you don't need uh, you don't need any level of of higher categories or anything um, so basically the the relationship is the part that is work in progress I guess um, so the idea is that here in the very end. Um, when you want to generalize to these higher cubes, then um, you you need to organize these uh, higher uh, these higher conditions that uh, these higher confluence shapes get get mapped to trivial things somehow. And um, I think the right way to do this is to use some higher categorical framework. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to explain why I think this, but maybe actually it's more related to, um, yeah, what do we have here? To these minimal truncation universal properties, uh, because here uh, for these minimal truncation properties, I said that this essentially gives us way to, to ways to construct functions from the end truncation of some type A into B and now I'm interested in the case where n is zero. So I want to, because in the end, I want to construct functions from the set truncation of some quotient. So the, the, from the set quotient of some lists into some other type. So in the end, I want to construct functions from the set quotient of these uh, ciphered Frank Kampen like lists into the equality types of, of the type D. So in these slides, now I have first constructed these, these maps into the one truncation of these equality types. But in the end, if I want to do it in general, I need the full power of these um, truncation universal properties to, to do the full, uh, to, to, to construct these functions into the fully non-truncated type. Good, yeah, I see now, thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, uh, can, can I comment? Or maybe it's an exchange echo note. Okay. Are you seeing myself? That was pleasurable. Um, no, no, no. Just mute your own microphone, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I hear you? Yeah, right. Um, so in principle, it could be possible that all of the things that I want to do 
can be done with one of these encodings of the of, of the set truncation, like the encoding that Eckbert has given, for example. Um, I mean, well, it could be possible that we can use that one. It just seems that this will be very hard because the what we want to do is what or what I want to do here is somewhat uniform, but probably not uniform enough. It's like with semi-simplicial types. The definition of uh, semi-simplicial types from the very beginning, uh, like, like here, uh, the definition of these a, a0, a1, a2, and so on is very uniform, but we don't get it to type check in type theory. So um, yeah, so, so I expect that in order to to do such an argument where you need these infinitely many levels of, of uh, confluence properties, you, you need to have some way to, to access the levels one by one. And this is something that is given in a, in a theory where you have uh, infinity categories. All right, anyone else? Questions, comments, or anything else? Uh -huh. Well, <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, maybe if this is the case, then I'm going to ask again. Are there any questions or comments? <laughs> you did not see that coming, did you? Um, okay. Um, so I guess um, I guess at that point maybe it would be appropriate to thank the speaker again. So I'm gonna unmute everyone. Uh, okay, and off we go. All right, well, thanks Nikolai for the talk. I'm going to stop the recording and I'll remind everyone that we'll meet in two weeks with uh, Guillaume and uh, that's it for this week. <laughs>